Jordan is both a PhD candidate and a lecturer in the Department of History. His scholarship focuses on the politics of natural history in the early 19th century. His doctoral dissertation, Anarchy in the Order of Nature, Conservatism, Reform, and Controversy in British Natural History, 1800 to 1850, examined the factionalization of naturalists along social, intellectual, and political lines in the decades after the French Revolution. In the dissertation, Jordan traced the careers of both adherents and detractors to William Sharp Maclay's strange, strange circular and quinary system of classification in order to reveal the interplay of philosophical and political commitments in the study of life. His work has been published in the Journal of the History of Biology, and his research has been supported by Uppsala University, where he was a visiting fellow in 2022. We are delighted to welcome Jordan Mersenna to speak. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you all for being here today. I first set foot in the halls of the Department of History sometime in September 2011 as an 18-year-old physics major here at Berkeley. I was visiting Professor Ethan Shagan's office hours to ask him questions about his recent lecture on the Protestant Reformation, and admittedly because the thought of talking to a Berkeley professor one-on-one -on -one just sounded cool at the time. What had excited me about the sciences was the interconnectedness of natural phenomena how figuring things out in one corner of the world impacted and fit together with everything else. How the physics interlocked with the chemistry, the chemistry with the molecular biology, the molecular biology with the physiology, the physiology with the ecology. It was exciting to piece together what seemed like a grand puzzle in nature. Through Ethan's treatment of the Protestant Reformation, I was beginning to see how that same interconnectedness existed in history. How a set of what I had considered well-delineated categories, religious, economic, political, social, and intellectual forces, all intertwined into a complex web of mutual interaction. In weighing whether to throw in his weight with Martin Luther or the Pope, what compelled any given German prince to action and to his eventual decision? Did he deeply believe the truth of Luther's message about how humans should see, understand, and live in the world? Or did he see a convenient pretext to attack the Catholic Lord one principality over and to gain taxation rights over his common form? Perhaps I began to realize it was some mixture of the two. Like the grand puzzle of nature, the puzzle of history displayed the same network of interconnections. Even the very conceptual categories, economics, knowledge, politics, religion, began to unravel the closer I looked. No one could be defined, let alone understood, without reference to the others. Before long, Ethan's lectures, and the lectures of many of our other renowned faculty, had won me over, and I left the physics department behind. Between us, this may have also had something to do with the fact that my introductory physics class started at 8 in the morning. But <laughs> I usually leave that part out of the story. I continue on the historian's path, and never look back. Admittedly, it hasn't been all roses since then. As someone who had aspirations to get a PhD since I was a young boy, it was hard to learn that the academic job market has never recovered from the Great Recession. If you're the parents of one of the PhD students up here today, I'm sure you've heard all about this. Maybe too much about it. Undergraduate enrollments are down nationally. Tenure-track jobs are far more scarce than they were 20 years ago. The academic life in history is shot through with uncertainty from start to finish. At one point, as I was contemplating the PhD, a former TA of mine put it bluntly, I don't want to see you put yourself through this. <laughs> Coming to terms with this harsh reality has not been easy for any of us up here on stage today. It's a subversion of the story many of us were sold growing up. Work hard, be smart and there will be a place for you in the academy. There is not space history would happen for all of us right now. But I believe that situation has also created something kind of beautiful. Instead of pursuing the hard path of a history PhD for the professorial reward it was historically designed to private access to, it has forced us to consider it on different terms. 
Everyone in these funny-looking robes up here made it this far because they love the craft of history and the life of the historian who pursues it. They made it because at some level they enjoyed the series of days in the life that led to it. Many of us have also taken this situation as an opportunity to focus on savoring the process. The pay can be a bit low and the stress and expectations high, but you might be surprised to hear that many of us would say that being a PhD student in the history department was actually a pretty great job. You set your own hours. You work with and learn from brilliant people at the top of their field. You befriend their brilliant and fascinating students. You get to live in Berkeley, California. Big work. Grad school here is reading, writing, teaching, but it's also hiking in the Berkeley Hills, house parties with your friends and colleagues, concerts in San Francisco, road trips to California's many natural wonders. Each of the soon-to-be doctors behind me made it to this stage, not just because of the excellence of their work over the better part of the past decade, but because they cultivated lives outside of their work that made that long commitment sustainable. The success we commemorate today is not just of their brilliant dissertations, on the cutting edge of historical research, but of their constitutions and characters, and of the day-to-day -day habits and commitments that led them to this stage in one piece with their heads held high, in spite of what at moments can feel like an atmosphere of existential adversity. What courses our lives will take from this point is perhaps more uncertain now than at any previous point in the history of the historical profession. But I think this experience has engendered the skills, intellectual, interpersonal, and human, for us to navigate those paths with thoughtful skill. In short, while I can't tell you exactly where we're all going, I'm not really that worried about it either. Knowing something about history means knowing something about human beings and the collective organizations they live within. That knowledge isn't just useful for writing books and teaching classes, it's useful for life. From another perspective, these questions of utility don't even really matter. There's inherent value in spending years immersing yourself in the study of a rich and detailed subject, and to crossing paths for that long moment with others who were doing the same in a beautiful and storied corner of the planet. Decades from now, when we each look back on this chapter in the history of our lives, from whatever vantages we occupy at that point, I'm confident that we'll all be able to truthfully say, it was a pretty good time. Right. Thank you. Yeah.